All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, TOP 2025, uh, which is a policy framework for enhancing the verifiability of research claims. Um, TOP has uh, recently undergone updates, and uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, you might already well be familiar with the uh, the top guidelines that were published back in 2015. They are uh, a modular framework of eight different standards that have three different graded levels of adoption. And these uh, graded levels of adoption are kind of the signature of the framework. Um, it allows uh, stakeholders who adopt the framework to flexibly um, select a level that meets their current uh, capacities or needs. Uh, the eight different standards focus on uh, different areas of transparency and openness of, of research outputs, it includes things like sharing data, sharing analysis code, um, pre-registration of study designs, pre-registration of analysis plans, replication, sharing materials, uh, citation of data, and um, uh, design and analysis transparency, which includes uh, adherence to reporting guidelines. Now, the original uh, top framework had over 5,000 uh, journal and organizational signatories. So it was a very uh, successful and widespread um, movement to take up these guidelines. And uh, as I said, the sort of modularity of the different uh, standards and the, the different levels um, of possible adoption were, were key to the success of the framework. However, um, over the years, as different uh, stakeholders have used TOP, there have been a number of, um, of issues that have come to light um, in terms of um, things that uh, after 10 years of use uh, need revision. And so um, a handful of the, the main uh, issues that the uh, proposed revisions aim to tackle are listed here. So we have um, inconsistent levels across standards. Now, as I just showed on the previous slide, it's supposed to be that um, for each of the eight domains, there's a um, specific uh, level of adoption that can be deployed. So for level one, it would be disclosure of um, the research practice. For level two, it's a requirement that uh, research outputs satisfy that standard. And for level three, there's some verification that the um, that the practice has been done to a certain level. However, when uh, we actually look at the at the guidelines, it turns out that these three uh, simple levels don't actually apply consistently across all standards. So top 2025 aimed to address that inconsistency. There was also dependencies across different standards. So, um, for example, the uh, data transparency and analytical uh, methods transparency both uh, had level three involving um, the checking of computational reproducibility, and that involves uh, having both of those artifacts available. It's not possible to check computational reproducibility if you don't have both the data and the code. So this created dependencies across standards each of these individual areas was not independent. We also saw that there was a lack of applicability um, for some practices to some methods. So <clears throat> um, for example, uh, qualitative research or other types of research might not have um, the same relevance for the different research practices um, across these different domains. And so um, the revision aims to um, broaden the scope of the research practices that are focused on so that there's a bride, uh, wider applicability for a greater variety of different research disciplines. And finally, there was um, poor reliability of scoring. So when um, evaluators attempted to look at journals that had implemented TOP, the different evaluators didn't necessarily agree with one another in terms of the level of implementation that we saw across the different domains. And so that suggested that there was a lack of clarity among some of the standards. And so the revision, um, we're seeking to address that lack of clarity and uh, make uh, the standards more consistent and interpretable. 
Um, so the body that's been responsible for um, helping to initiate the revisions is the, the top advisory board. Um, it's convened by the Center for Open Science, which is sort of the um, the convener for the group, the, the parent of the, the top guidelines. And um, in 2022, we reconstituted the advisory board. So we uh, retained the members um, from the previous uh, community governance structure that wanted to still be involved. And then we added new members as well. Um, this board is overseen by uh, the Center for Open Science Director of Policy, David Meller, who I uh, see is here today. Um, and uh, my role was in supporting uh, Center for Open Science in terms of uh, helping to create this governance structure. And um, once we had the reconstituted governance structure in place, um, I have been working with the board chair, uh, Sean Grant, and co-chair, Suzanne Stewart. Which I, I also saw Suzanne. I don't know if, if Sean is here as well, but, um, but Suzanne is here today. Um, and we've been working, you know, for the last many months to um, prepare the, the paper um, that we've uh, now reprinted that describes these proposed revisions. Okay, so I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about um, the proposed revisions themselves, um, because rather than dwell too much on the previous framework, I think it's it's illustrative to focus on uh, what TOP will be like going forward. And so um, we made three major classes of revisions um, that were um, that addressed the, the uh, flaws that were raised earlier. So first of all, we reorganized the structure of TOP into three categories of standards. So rather than just having one group of eight standards, there are now three distinct categories of standards called research practices, verification practices, and verification studies. Um, and this reorganized structure much better fits uh, the overall goals of TOP and, and will uh, go into a, a little bit more detail in a moment about what makes these three categories um, different from one another and, and why they help um, help address the flaws we raised earlier. We also um, address the issue of consistency of levels. So now uh, the research practices in the revised framework have now consistent levels um, and those levels are relabeled, disclose, share, insight, and certify. And so in a moment, we'll, we'll go into detail about what those levels look like. And then finally, we also made a handful of revisions to individual research practices, again, to address um, updates that have uh, happened in the intervening years. So I want to start by um, discussing the reorganized structure of the top, um, and then we'll move on to talking about the consistent levels. So the top 2025 framework, as I said, has three distinct categories of um, research practices. The first is called research practices and involves seven uh, distinct things that researchers can do um, that uh, increase the transparency uh, of their research outputs and make those research outputs um, more verifiable. Um, there are also two um, verification practices, and these verification practices combine the outputs of two or more research practices and allow study claims to be checked. So including uh, verification practices in the revised structure allows us to address uh, the issue before about dependencies between different, um, different standards. So now each of the individual uh, seven research practices are all independent. And when combined, um, they can be um, deployed to um, they can be deployed to help establish um, verification at a higher level. Um, for verification studies, uh, that is the third category of um, of artifacts um, in the model. Uh, verification studies are uh, study designs and publication formats that help to increase um, the probing of reliability uh, of claims and robustness of those claims. So by uh, independently checking in other additional studies, the original claims that a study makes, we can help to um, increase the verifiability of those claims overall. 
So all three of these different categories, uh, research practices, verification practices, and verification studies, all of them work together to achieve the overall objective of TOP, which is to increase the verifiability of empirical research claims. All right, so in terms of consistent levels, um, we now have three consistent levels for the research practices as addressed before, and uh, those three levels are outlined here. So as before, uh, level one involves disclosure. Um, researchers at achieving level one for a particular practice need to state whether or not the practice was done, and if so, uh, its location, so what the um, repository where it's stored or or how the practice was achieved. So that's level one disclosure. Um, this level provides sort of an easy entry point for um, researchers seeking to increase transparency of their practices. Um, and for, for journals and other stakeholders, it allows um, that sort of baseline of, um, of transparency. The second level, share and cite, involves researchers uh, re having a requirement to do a particular practice and share the output of that practice, and then cite uh, the location of the output in, a, in its trusted repository. So things like data, materials, uh, code, registrations, and so on. Um, at level two, they're required to be done and to be shared and then cited in a, in a trusted repository. Um, one benefit is that this new um, focus on citation uh, increases the prominence of um, the need to cite research artifacts regardless of their type. So the original um, top guidelines, uh, there was a data citation standard. Now citation is incorporated into level two and um, the directive is to uh, cite all shared research artifacts, not just data. So if um, someone is making use of uh, open materials, they should be citing them. Uh, open code, it should be cited and so on. Um, this also adds some flexibility um, for uh, researchers who are reusing existing data materials and code. So if um, the researcher is not uh, sharing the uh, open artifact themselves, there's still a directive to cite the open output in its trusted repository. So the new uh, new level two, I think, encompasses a wider variety of uh, fields and approaches than the previous one, and it increases the, the prominence and importance of um, citation for uh, tracking the use of open artifacts. At level three, um, the uh, research outputs that are shared are certified by an independent party, and they are certifying that a practice has been done to disciplinary best practice standards. Um, so it, it is uh, similar to the level three in the original top framework, but it's clarifying that it's an independent party that's doing the certification. And it adds the, a new feature that the focus is on disciplinary best practice standards. So again, here, it may be that across different fields and disciplines, there are different uh, best practice standards that would be um, the point of comparison for these certifications. It's also given the um, new uh, focus on uh, each of the individual research practices being independent these certifications are focused on those independent practices. So for example, um, a study protocol, certification of a study protocol could involve um, checking the completeness of that protocol. It could in involve checking the timing of sharing of that protocol um, to make sure that, that completeness and timing are done in accordance with uh, best practices for a given discipline. And what those best practices are, are, are up for um, nomination by individual disciplines, societies, et cetera. Um, so there's a real role or opportunity here for uh, methodologists or other um, standards making bodies to uh, specify um, the best practices that um, would be certified by, by a journal or another entity um, adopting top at level three. Um, so all seven of these uh, research practices are now aligned so that they have these consistent uh, levels 
of disclosure, uh, share and cite, and certify. Um, as I said before, different research practices then combine to undergird the ver verification practices. So the two verification practices that we're highlighting in the framework are comprehensive reporting and computational reproducibility. Um, comprehensive reporting is um, involves uh, verifying the completeness of reporting and comparing uh, reports of results to um, the plans for the study that were specified ahead of time. So things like registrations, protocols, analysis plans, and so on. When we check for comprehensive reporting, we're checking that all of the relevant details that were outlined in those plans are specified in the final report. Um, this helps to, to check for things like um, outcome switching or um, the omission of, of primary research outcomes and so on all kinds of different things that can be examined to make sure that full details, full reports are given uh, in a final research report compared to what was uh, planned or intended. Uh, verifying computational reproducibility uh, relies on open materials, open data, uh, open code, and that lets uh, independent analysts check um, the reproducibility of results that are underlying um, various empirical claims. So both of these um, verification practices, comprehensive reporting and, and computational reproducibility, are distinct from the research practices that uh, precede them because they involve a combination of those practices. And it's only with um, those practices that um, the presence of comprehensive reporting and, and computational reproducibility can be checked. The last uh, component of the framework is verification studies. And these are um, study designs and publication formats that focus on verification. Um, they are distinct from the practices and the um, verification, um, verification practices and the research practices um, because they require some stakeholder support to implement. So for example, journals need to uh, allow the submission of replication studies, or they need to offer the registered report study type. Um, so these are not things that uh, researchers can necessarily implement on their own, and they require this, this uh, stakeholder uh, support in order to be able to enact. Um, now, these four study types are meant to represent a, a possible larger pool of uh, studies so there may be you know, other um, verification studies that would be proposed or added to this pool in the future. Um, but for now, um, these four types are, are the ones that we settled on. They all allow um, the checking of, of the robustness and verification of, um, of claims and research studies. Um, and just to say a little bit about more about what these four studies are, uh, replication studies, of course, uh, attempt to um, replicate in a new sample um, the major procedures that were done in an original study and see whether similar results are obtained. So it's same design, um, but new data to see whether new results hold. A registered report is a publication format where authors are offered in principle acceptance on a uh, research protocol that is peer reviewed prior to actually conducting the study. Once um, once that protocol is reviewed and in principle acceptance is obtained, journals agree to publish the final results of the report, regardless of how the results turn out. Uh, so if the, the results turn out to be null or not supportive of a hypothesis or, or what have you, a journal is still committing to, um, to share the results of those studies. Um, multiverse studies are ones where um, Multiple analyses are done uh, on the same data set to probe um, the robustness of, of claims relating to those analyses. And many analyst studies are studies where many different individual uh, researchers address the same research question on the same data and uh, potentially arrive at uh, the same or, or different conclusions. So all of these studies designs have in common that they're focused on um, verification of claims in original studies, but it's done by uh, teams that are typically independent of original researchers. 
All right. <clears throat> so I said before that um, there were three major classes of revisions. There was the, the changes to the structure of the framework. There was the um, uh, making levels consistent. And the last change was uh, changes to some of the practices themselves. So I already discussed um, the major change to level two of the framework, which is to incorporate the former cita data citation standard into level two of the framework. So share and cite is now the prominent uh, label for level two. Um, another change that happened is that the um, label for the um, design and analysis reporting transparency standard was simplified to just reporting transparency. Um, and hopefully this makes it a little bit more clear that the focus of this standard is on uh, adherence to reporting guidelines and, and uh, complete reporting in studies. Um, and a final change um, involves the labeling of the um, registration standards. There used to be two uh, registration standards and they were both um, referred to pre-registration. We've now shifted that language from pre-registration to just simply registration to reflect a broader uh, range of, um, of studies and to make clear that um, we want researchers to specify the timing of their registrations in their uh, papers and their research. Um, but the term pre-registration was ambiguously referring to um, was not was not uh, used universally across different fields and referred to um, some ambiguous practices. So here we are now streamlining the terminology um, to better reflect use, uh, longer standing use in biomedical fields. Um, we've also uh, additionally separated out study protocols from um, the registration standards. So in the previous version of TOP, study protocols were sort of lumped in into the pre-registration uh, standards, and now they are rightly pulled out as their own uh, artifact. And together, study registration, study protocols, and analysis plans form sort of three three parts, three crucial ingredients to uh, fully specifying research plans ahead of time. Um, a, uh, a registration involves entering a time-stamped publicly available record about a study in a register that enter that assigns a unique and permanent study identifier. And um, it, study registrations do not necessarily involve, you know, detailed plans about um, analysis plans or study designs and so on. Those other uh, features belong um, more succinctly in um, study protocols and analysis plans. So we think that this revision, you know, better articulates the um, the function and, and definition of registration, and it also more clearly spells out that there's an expectation for researchers to be sharing um, full protocols, full analysis plans, and registering their studies. All right, so um, I want to uh, close by talking about some potential different applications for the framework um, from the point of view of different stakeholders. Um, and we we have just a few minutes uh, left, so I, I will go through these fairly quickly. Um, if, uh, if there's some time at the end, I can still take a few questions, but... Um, okay, so from the point of view of... Um, Journals and preprint servers, there's a number of things that um, journals and preprint servers can consider when it comes to the three different classes of um, top um, artifacts. So for research practices, we encourage journals to uh, adopt various top levels to consider the framework and decide which level they want to adopt for each of the, the practice standards. We encourage uh, journals to incorporate top into their submission guidelines. And we also encourage them to require a top statement. Top statement is a succinct way for researchers to uh, disclose the availability of their data, code, materials, registrations, protocols, and so on. For verification practices, uh, both journals and preprint servers can consider their review procedures, if any. So. Um, for journals that are sending articles out for peer review, you might consider whether you want to have a specific reviewer or editor who's assigned to 
um, consider um, issues related to computational reproducibility or uh, research uh, comprehensiveness, comprehensive reporting. Um, depending on your goals and available resources, you might consider an external service to verify. So there are journals already that are using external services um, to check computational reproducibility of results. Um, certainly these are not um, resource light, <laughs> excuse me, resource light uh, suggestions, but nonetheless, um, there's an opportunity to make a big impact in terms of improving the, the quality of the uh, research that's reported in your, in your journal or on your service. For verification studies, we're encouraging journals and preprint servers to enable, incentivize, and require um, these studies. Enabling involves uh, allowing these studies to be done and submitted at your journal. Um, incentivization involves developing reward schemes um, and requiring um, you could even imagine a journal or, or perhaps a special section in a, in a journal or something that would um, require every study to have a verification study of some kind. Um, certainly this seems like not the sort of thing that we might want to do with every single study in the entire literature ever, but um, journals could decide which studies uh, they might want to require um, verification for. Beyond uh, journals and preprint servers, other stakeholders also have potential actions they can take. Um, for re individual researchers, um, it's a good goal to strive to achieve top level two or higher for your own applicable research projects. So this would include um, registering all studies, sharing full study protocols, um, sharing analysis plans ahead of time, openly sharing materials, data, and code. Uh, adhering to reporting guidelines, and so on. Um, we might also advise that you could uh, choose to publish in outlets that offer certification services. I think this would be attractive for authors to have um, journals uh, or preprint services that offer certification as a benefit of submitting to that uh, title. Um, we recommend if, if a journal or funder or university is, is offering uh, a verification practice as a service that you take advantage of it. And researchers, of course, themselves can also verify others' works. So you can do check computational reproducibility yourself. You can uh, assess comprehensive reporting by comparing original research to um, the uh, registered plans. Uh, perhaps a Good rule of thumb um, it might be to dedicate at least 5% of your efforts to verifying others' work and publish your reviews. Make it public um, what you have done at when you've done this checking. Departments, individual labs, and universities also have um, uh, things that they can do to incorporate the framework. You can incorporate top into your hiring or tenure and promotion guidelines. You could have a top statement as part of a narrative CV adopt top levels for your department. Um, and uh, with regards to verification practices, you could offer verification as a service to your staff, or you could lobby your uh, research and development office, your, your university's research office to offer this support. Um, it could easily imagine um, statistics or other units um, offering these uh, verification services as a service to their colleagues um, if the right incentive structure was enabled by a university. You can offer recognition and rewards uh, to staff for doing verification studies, offer some, uh, particular training for learning how to do these kinds of studies and create infrastructure that increases collaboration. So you could imagine uh, members of an, an individual department working together to um, verify uh, published claims. Lastly, for funders, uh, likewise, funders can adopt particular top levels for re work that they fund. You can incorporate top into your uh, RFPs and annual reports for grantees. Again, as in terms of um, verification practices, this could be offered as a service to your grantees. I think this is something that grantees would find valuable and uh, improve the quality of the research that you are uh, supporting. 
You can also reward grantees who get verified. So if people are willing to submit their work to a particular type of service, then uh, you could offer additional incentives for doing so. Um, lastly, you can recognize and reward grantees for doing verification studies. You can offer training to them to do those studies and offer dedicated funding for verification. These are often uh, underfunded areas uh, at present. Okay, so uh, I hope this has served as a useful introduction to uh, both the original top guidelines and the proposed revisions to the top framework. Um, the QR code on the screen has a link to the preprint where, um, actually I think it has a link to the COS blog about the preprint, <laughs> um, which includes a spot where you can give uh, feedback on the changes. Um, we're, we're currently um, getting ready to submit this to a journal. So uh, the sooner you can get feedback, the better. Um, these slides are, are up on OSF, so you can get those there as well. And uh, I'm happy to stay for questions if there are any for, from anybody, though I know we're at our time. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kate.